Well, good day to you all. This is Joseph Antel with Adjuvant Protocols for Healing. I'd like to welcome you today to the Zoom teaching. As you know, I've been doing this for many years now, seven, I believe, uh, teaching the Heart Sound Recorder in the last two years, working with my book, Adjuvant Protocols for Healing. For quite a while, we considered different conditions in the book and reviewed those. And as I showed you here, I have a YouTube channel that you can access and listen to these and get the notes. And now I have started a series of working with different clients that I still work with to this day. I don't have a full practice, but I do have a virtual nutrition practice. And so the different themes that I'm going to create uh, from now on until we exhaust uh, this theme uh, will be related to actual clients and their health and how I work with them, which is all based on the protocols in my book. Today, we're going to look at uh, client 72 She's been a client of mine for decades and in recent years has had challenges with atrial fibrillation. So we're going to look at this today and get started. Remember th that medical science does the best that they can. They have certain ranges of tools, as do we as holistic practitioners using nutrition and our other modalities. And my intent with writing the book, Adjuvant Protocols for Healing, is to give you more accurate, specific starting points and continuation um, ideas with these clients that we move through life with. You can think back at your clients that you have had some of them for decades, as I have. Or your new clients that come into you with handfuls of different medications and other supplements. And you just think to yourself, where, where do I start? And so that is our challenge. And remember that I will spend the rest of my life on this planet with you going deeper, going deeper into why these different conditions occur, what to some degree medical science, how, what the tools that they have and how they look at it, but going deeper by going back, going back to original thought, going back to the original endocrinologist, that were, were really the world around. And this book, uh, Practical Endocrinology, I primarily teach you all out of this book. And it is unique. Uh, the other teachers are wonderful using standard process, but they don't use this book as much as I do, if at all. And so, they mainly focus in on Dr. Lee and, uh, and John Courtney and other great teachers, which I do as well. But we have to go back to what they were thinking, in my opinion, so that we get go into the, the deeper ranges of thought. Because medical science, with many conditions, does not have those inroads that we have of going back to the principles of nature and how they are applied through using whole food vitamin supplements, herbs, uh, homeopathics, if you will. I don't teach homeopathics, but others do. And so this is this book and uh, it, it really, uh, this book lays the groundwork, makes a statement about my work with you uh, for the, for the, as I say, uh, 
the rest of our professional time and uh, personal time that we have uh, on this planet. There are some workers who believe that hormones are produced also by the heart. Remember, this book was written in 1932. Now they know and admit that, for instance, the heart makes hormones. It makes these communicative uh, substances. Uh, memories, pineal, the prostate makes its own hormones and the spleen. That's what they were looking at. So uh, that's what they were concerned about and thinking about. But then they went a step further in going deeper themselves. Now remember, this is 1932. These are doctors from all over the world that Dr. Henry Harrower had a relationship with and he writes in this book. Practical endocrinology no longer is concerned merely with the study of the ductless glandular diseases. Okay, that's good. Nor with the clinical possibilities of their hormone alone, but with every active principle. So they're going deeper into the principles of nature with endocrine characteristics that can be used to enlarge our professional service to humanity. God bless them. That's right. That's what they were doing and that got lost. That's why I wanna get as much of this teaching to you and have you think this way as possible. In the control of those physiological functions, it is all about functions, my friends. It's all about function. If you look at the labels of standard process, you, can, you will never be impressed with amounts, but you do know in your experience thus far that using these products is all about function and that's where they were at. Physiological functions that have been found to respond to these subtle, to these subtle hormone influences. The whole premise of Dr. Lee's teaching was Endocrine communicates with the body and that always has to be considered along with, that's why there's so many of the 25, I believe, uh, protomorphogens that endocrine and organ function, the hormones that they secrete. They may not be primary hormones, but they may be secondary hormones. But, never, but communication chemicals or communication substances, nevertheless. And I'll give you one example now, which we'll go back to at the very end of this lecture. The liability to sudden death, however, now you're probably thinking now, why is Joe talking about this right now in the lecture? related to the heart. Well, let's read on. The liability to sudden death, however, is not a feature of this condition. On the other hand, oh, that was uh, related to what they were saying prior, excuse me. On the other hand, says Morrow, the sudden failure of the heart is the central point of the whole thymus problem. If you go to your cardiologist and you have atrial fibrillation, you have other arrhythmic path, 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 uh, patterns, problems. Your cardio, I'll give you, a, send you a hundred dollar check if your cardiologist says, oh, well, well we, sh we need to check into your thymus. They have no idea. And that's okay, they have their other tools, but we have the idea. And a better term for the condition would be status cardiothymicus. So what that means is the relationship between the thymus and the heart. 
the hormones that the thymus secretes in relationship to the heart, which he believes to be a definite pathological entity. He did not use the word possible. He used the word definite. You never hear about it. He discusses the possible connection, now he uses the word possible out of humility, between the thymic enlargement and the cardiac failure. Mentioning as ideological possibilities, such conditions as hyperthymization, uh, in other words, overactive thymus, dysthymization, underactive thymus, hormonal disharmony. What was he talking about there? Hormonal disharmony between the thymus and the heart? Hormonal disharmony between other parts of the body? It's a good conversation. It's a good uh, question to have. And an anatomical nervous theory. In other words, how does nerve function throughout the body and within the heart affect the person in such ways that they experience cardiac failure? So this is what we're going to break down. This is the book. Now, I read this book because I lecture to you and work out of it almost every day. Because the minute I finish this PowerPoint with you, I'm going to start on the next one, which I haven't decided what I'm going to teach yet. I go right to this book. That's where I start. Now, there's other literature. There's Lee's newsletters. There's a lot of literature in the Celine River Press Historical Archives. You, you, could, you, can't, you won't exhaust reading these articles in your lifetime. So, but you can download this book, by the way, at no cost other than the printing, the printer ink, which is very expensive now. So, and then you can start highlighting. You can tell the copies of my book where I highlight it because I've read quite a bit of this book. So what, let's just take the heart hormones as a preface to what we wanna talk about today. Because why does client 72, why has she had AFib her entire life? Why? And why, as she went through menopause and has gotten older, that it's gotten so extreme that she's needed major medical intervention? Why? because a loss of the hormonal balance. Now, even though, as I said, these aren't primary hormones, they still are communicating uh, chemicals that work with the rest of the body. And the endocrine system influence those hormones influencing the heart. Remember the word hormone, what does it mean? I arose and set in motion. So if the hormone balance is not there, there's no getting up, there's no arising, and there's no setting in motion in the balanced way, in the way of nature, the way, the way nature designed it. Now, it is, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I, it is found that the heart contains a cell type known as intrinsic cardiac adrenergic uh, ICA cells. These cells release noradrenaline. Oh, noradrenaline, what is that tied in with? You all remember this. Noradrenaline is tied in with sleep issues with the pineal. It is noradrenaline that tells the pineal to help regulate the day-night cycle. P 
people that have uh, inability to sleep, to stay asleep. And dopamine neurotransmitters. Well, this relates dopamine, the focus of that is the hypothalamus. Once thought to be produced only by the central nervous system. So now, even though this was written in the 80s, they, they have a much greater realization of how much the heart influences other parts of the body. I've just given you two. More recently, it was discovered that the heart also secretes oxy, oxytocin, commonly referred to as the love or bonding hormone. Now, you've heard me reference this before. So I'm not going to read it through. You can uh, read it through and have some consideration in yourself about this. Concentrations of oxytocin in the heart were found to be as high as those found in the brain, as those produced in the pituitary. So now we know that there is a relationship between the pituitary and the heart. They both work together releasing oxytocin. And God knows the world needs, what is that? the uh, cognition to actually be able to read something and understand it and consider it with other people, tolerance, adaptation, complex sexual and maternal behaviors, relationships with each other. So we're not just looking at, you know, we'll take this for this. No, no, we're look, looking at an understanding of how these things work together. Here's another line that ties in with this, with the, with the nervous system related to these hormones. He therefore designated it as an autonomic substance. So these hormones or the hormone of cardiac action. In 1932, they didn't know what they knew in the 80s, or did they? They did, they didn't know what it was. Here he calls it, or hormone of cardiac action. So we all, you know, we always consider, well, what is at the core of this atrial fibrillation? Of all these issues with the heart that medical science has band-aids for, but they cannot get. They have never been able to get to the reason using natural substances to help clear these things. The hormone of cardiac action. The heart beats within itself. It can be interfered with with the autonomic nervous system, yes, the brain can override the rhythms of the heart. We know that. So there's your hypothalamus, there's your pituitary using glandulars and vitamins and minerals to help balance them, which we'll look at, we'll get into a little bit here. But this relationship of these hormones that is so vital that the heart within itself, is it what is ruling the cells to beat naturally? I say to you, it is this hormonal factor within the heart. The view that the heartbeat is regular by a humoral humoral substance. So here it is, that it regulates, and you could read more when you get into it. So here we have this condition um, of these arrhythmic patterns. In, in client 72, it's related to obviously hormonal changes 
but it's also related to what has happened to this person's heart itself. And I want to touch into this because this is a this is really this is 2022 now that they're now they're seeing these other problems that are happening out of these imbalances, not only nutritional, but hormonal imbalances related to the heart. Cardiomyopathy refers to conditions that affect your heart muscle. If you have cardiomyopathy, which in my opinion, most people with arrhythmic patterns have some degree of cardiomyopathy. So let's look at what that is. Your heart can't effectively pump blood to the rest of the body. You and I have read thousands now of graphs. And what do we see? I'm going to show you three other clients of mine today. What do we see? The heart cannot pump blood to the rest of their body. As a result, you may experience fatigue, shortness of breath, or heart palpitations. Here is that arrhythmic pattern. Or in the case of atrial fibrillation with client 72, palpitations, normalization, palpitations, normalizations. Her whole life, since she could remember. Cardiomyopathy gets worse over time. Treatment can slow the progression and improve your quality of lifestyle. So cardiomyopathy refers to conditions that affect the heart muscle. Uh, can make your heart stiffen, enlarged, or thicken, and can cause scar tissue as a result. Your heart can't pump the blood. And John Courtney, of course, when he taught me and uh, my colleague, Mark Anderson, and others who are still around, he said, remember, Joe, the heart just doesn't enlarge like all the whole heart at the same time. It could be part of the heart, one quadrant of the heart, one part of the heart. And he used the analogy, if you roll a car down the hill, and when the car settles at the bottom, one door closes perfectly and the other door has a crack in it. You can actually see light through it. So that's what happens to the heart. One valve could be leaking and the others are fine. Through this change, damage, or in this case, where it's uh, is thickening. Now, this is the, the recent article that I shared a couple of weeks ago. The US is also expected to see the split between familiar heredity in relationship to the heart, where the patient develops cardiomyopathy as a result of another condition or factor. In other words, stress, hereditary factors, as they say, infection, in stark contrast to nearly every other country all the other countries of the world, France, UK, Germany, Japan, Italy, and Canada are those seven MM countries. They're all evenly split between the inherited and the familiar. We are not. The US portion of acquired cardiomyopathies, oh, it's not heredity, is doubled that of inherited. The rest of the world, heart conditions, they say are, are inherited, but not the US. They are acquired. Oh, they're, and they're, they're twice the rest of the world. Well, what are we doing wrong here? Well, we have the most money in our healthcare system. What are we doing wrong? The high portion of acquired cardiomyopathies in the US may be attributed to a higher number of individuals engaging in lifestyle factors. You and I have been talking about this, that we are not teaching 
our clients and just giving supplements out without any thought. We are teaching them how to live better, more balanced. Because if they don't, cardiomyopathies will definitely, there's no possibility, definitely be a big factor as they age. Engaging in lifestyle factors that place them at a high risk of developing cardiomyopathy. Uh, Gabriel, these factors include not limited to diet, alcohol, lack of exercise. And I would say to you, which we have discussed many times, stress. The rest of the world, now you could say, well, you know, Ukraine and this, yes, the rest of the world has stresses, but the majority of the world, especially these countries in uh, Europe and uh, Northern uh, uh, Canada, they have a less stress in their life than we do. Now, was this just a random study? No, this report is 10 years in not only study, but a forecast for the diagnose, prevention, and causes of cardiomyopathies. So you can read this through and you can read more about what cardiomyopathies are. But remember, that cardiomyopathies, uh, cardiomyopathies, you have to consider if the immune, remember we have talked about using the protomorphogens because of autoimmune factors. They admit it here. If the immune, if the immune response does not lead to complete elimination of infectious agents or inflammation processes after the removal of a virus, chronic myocardial damage may develop. Not may, it will develop. So here's the infectious piece. Here is the, the necrotic cells leaking into the blood. The body creates antibodies, gets rid of those, then goes and attacks the source. Naturally so. The immune system does not want that primary organ here, the heart, leaking bad cells back in. So inher in, in, in its inherency, it wants to get rid of that. What's gonna stop that? Drugs? No. Protomorphogens can though, or at least settle it down. Persistence of virus in the myocardium, uh, post-infectious immune reaction, just what I explained, autoimmunity. Look how many thing, times they refer to the immune system. And primary cardiac damage may result in the development of progression of ventricular dysfunction developed uh, of cardiac arrhythmias. Here it is. Why did client 72 develop these arrhythmias? Well, you know what they told me. Chronic infections, ear infections, since birth. Here you go. And uh, exacerbation of symptoms. So I've made my point here. So let's get into the, from my book, the primary products that I've had this person on and that they will need to use for the rest of their lives. These are the products. And then let's, let's get into this atrial fib. So atrial fib is an irregular, or often rapid heart rhythm that can lead to blood clots in the heart. AFib increases the risk of stroke, uh, risk of stroke other related conditions. This is important to client 72. During AFib, the heart's upper changes, chambers, the atrium beat chroni chron chronically and, and irregularly, chaotically, I'm sorry, and ir irregularly. 
Atrial fib is normal, fast, normal, slow, normal, fast, out of sync with the lower chambers, the ventricle of the heart. For many people, AFib may have no symptoms. Client 72 has lived most of their life without any symptoms, even though they knew they've had this. They've been told they have. But in latter years, it gets worse. Just what they, medical science. AFib may cause a fast pounding heartbeat, palpitations, shortness of breath, and weakness. So let's look at this person's life. Okay, client 72, because I named them that because that's how old they are. And she was uh, basically what they call an Irish twin. Her brother uh, was born after her um, and both parents smoked. So there you, there's the one thing, they, she, the other big factor that they grew up with secondhand smoke. They've eaten a good life, uh, eaten well throughout their life. Since 1970, that's a long time. Organically grown vegetables, farm-raised meats. His, his backed off the meats now, mainly vegetables with light protein. And, and they walk two miles a day. Recalled having an irregular heart rate throughout my life. This is why when you do your, your case, your opening case uh, analysis on an individual, ask them it, how their heart is. There's many, and I do a whole lecture on what, the, what to ask. It's in my chronicles of my YouTube uh, teachings. Find out. This is, was big. This is, you can pick this up on the system survey form too. Now, when did this start? When the fire started on the West Coast and the smoke was very bad, it was hard to breathe. And that precipitated, that was after that, this AFib started. She was in the hospital. They worked with her with drugs and uh, giving her uh, dioxin. And uh, she's on that, which is a heart stimulant. She's on a hypertensive uh, medication, even though she doesn't really have high blood pressure, but they put her on that. Because of this AFib, remember, atrial fibrillation can cause stroke and other things if your blood pressure goes high along with it. And then Eliquis, now they're thinning her blood out. So as a clinician, these are my challenges. So what can I say? Well, if you don't get off these, I can't help you. No, 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 that's not, that's not our role. So we work around this or with whatever a person decides to do. And so these are the products which I'll go through that I have her on right now. Now, would I like to see her taking a higher dose of some of these? Yes, but this was what she was willing to do. So this is, uh, this is their recent uh, echocardiogram, April 7th, 22. Now with all this going on, yet the use of a good lifestyle with her, despite maybe any emotional factors that have happened in this person's life, which I, emotional things happen to all of us in our life. She's no exception. This past infection, the fact that her parents smoked, she grew up with that, all of it. Here it is, left ventricle is normal. Left ventricle ejection fraction, the, the highest you can get is 70. She's almost 60, pretty good, right? Left atrium is severely dilated. And here you're probably wondering why I, started talking about cardiomyopathy in the beginning because she does have that. She's got 
inflammation. She's got, probably got some thickening. Here it is, left atrium severely dilated, right atrium severely dilated. This is the body compensating for not just nutritional needs, but all of these other factors that have happened to them her, uh, in her life. There is a mild to moderate aortic regurgitation. There is a mild mitral regurgitation. There is a mild tricuspid regurgitation. So what is that telling us? That's telling us that her heart is enlarged to some degree, at least in different places. And it is pulled away so that the valve, which is cartilage, isn't budging. But you've got all this leakage going on. Estimated pulmonary artery pressure is normal. There is no uh, precardial effusion. That means, um, that means a buildup of fluid. All good signs. You could say, geez, man, she should have more than this showing up with her life. But this is lifestyle and nutrition. So, um, I'm not going to read through all of this. It just goes through that she has her heart is basically um, normal in appearance, but she has these areas still. So would I like to see some of the medications dropped in dosage? Sure. Even get off some of them. But that's up to her and with her cardiologist. And by the way, they were thinking of doing um, a heart valve uh, surgery. I don't know, but replacement, I can't remember, or repair. And they've decided not to do it now. They said, oh, you can wait. So things are changing or stabilizing for the good. So here is your normal graph. I want to show you that before I show you hers. Now, I started working with her in... Um, in 2018, and you can see the pattern. Here's the AFib, love, dub, rest, that's normal. This should be two to one, right? And the height of the second sound to the first. But then she goes into, you can see it. But look, as she goes into the AFib, look how weak the S1s get. Remember, I was telling, we, we had read uh, earlier on about that Harrower and his colleagues were concerned about the ability of the butt, the heart to pump blood throughout the body. Here is the sign of the diminishing of it. See it? There should be three peaks here. You see, this is a normal S1 and a real good one. See it? See it? See it? And the heart speeds up. And you can see the pattern, not just in this quadrant, but all the way through. That's why when Lynn helped me uh, pick these out for you, we put the pattern because the pattern and an extra beat. So uh, extra beats, where's the extra beats? Oh, we put them in here somewhere. Anyway, you could see it in all four quadrants of the heart. Now, this is her uh, May, um, I saw this client. And now you can see that she's got the three, almost three peaks all the time, right? Almost all the time, not quite. The second sounds to the first are good, but she still has the same pattern of fast to slow, but it's when it goes fast, it gradually is improving. Now you'll see a cycle like this, S1, S2, where it isn't but the majority of them are two to one. This is two to one, one to one, one to one or worse, back to two to one. So is she completely free of AFib? No. Will we ever get to that point? Probably not. But we can help strengthen what she's got. She has the willingness to take the supplements and the willingness to live a lifestyle that does not continue to exacerbate cardiomyopathies, which the thickening and the, 
the leakage. And we didn't even talk about that. There's a, see this looks like a tooth. That's a little bit of leakage. There's none here, a little bit here and not much here. So that's even getting better. The leakage here, none, maybe a little. So, so what do they have planned for her, which she hasn't done? I'm not gonna go into all of these. They have electrical cardioversion, and you can read about these. They have cardiac ablation, but I wanted to give you these. These is what they offered her and a pacemaker. And as I said, the surgery. So remember that if people choose to do this, they can still use the supplements throughout. They should not stop taking supplements at any time, in my opinion, throughout any of these procedures, because the supplements are going to continue to reinforce the stabilization and remove the burden on this organ to function. So she has right here, this mitral valve is not closing properly. And she has a lot of swelling in, uh, remember we read about it in this part, the atrium on this left side. And I think it said on the right side too. So this upper part of her heart is what is, um, has probably scar tissue, has swelling. And remember that the normal beat of the heart starts on this right side. And that's probably why it has been like that throughout her life. So again, the, here's the products. And any you'll see in my book, any, any protocol is going to have consistency. So you say, all right, atrial fibrillation, general fibrillation, these products. If you look at arrhythmias, look, same products. I add in some uh, herbs and some other things, which I also gave to her because atrial fibrillation is a form of an arrhythmic pattern, which is a form of cardiomyopathy, a uh, uh, cause of cardiomyopathy more than likely. Now, the first product, as I said to you, what what is happening? Well, necrotic cells, heart cells from infection, damage, emotions. Yes, emotions, broken heart syndrome, same pattern, everyone, have leaked into the blood. Now the body has created antibodies and now it's affecting the primary source of that leakage. Here it is. What year is this, by the way? This is 2021, last year. The role of antibodies in arrhythmic genesis has been the subject of research in recent times. Well, that's good. But the original endocrinologists were looking at it way back. 1932 and before that. This review focuses on the rapid expanding field of autoantibody um, medicated cardiac arrhythmias, arrhythmias. Since the discovery of cardiac antibodies more than three decades ago, a great deal of effort has been devoted to understanding their contribution to arrhythmias. Different cardiac receptors and ion channels were identified as targets of autoantibodies. In other words, the immune system is doing what it absolutely should. The immune system is not acting abnormally. That's what medical science will tell you. That's not true. The immune system is, is trying to eliminate these dead cells. Now, it's confused by attacking the heart with normal cells. But that's the way it's designed. And the immune system always overdoes it. So here is where the protomorphogen comes in. The time has come. Well, I'm glad. 
but where have you been all my life? The time has come to acknowledge autoimmune cardiac arrhythmias as a distinct disease entity. They wouldn't admit it, but now they are. Establishing the antibody profile of patients will help develop uh, novel treatment approaches for patients. Well, I have a normal treat, no, novel treatment for you, cardiotrophin. There's the no, novel treatment. Not that we're treating the disease. We are simply using Dr. Lee's genius principle of removing the burden. So what's happening now, if someone takes the cardiotrophin, the antibodies now attack this. They attack the nuclear proteins in the cardiotrophin instead of attacking her heart. It's as simple as that. It removes the burden. Then her heart can begin to heal with the other supplements, and which I'll go through. B vitamins, super EFF. Now, originally, this was an original right in here. This is the now the that standard puts out about cardiotrophin. But you could see this is fascinating to read this. Um, cardiotrophin is an extract of beef heart that acts as a heart muscle tonic, second uh, um, to uh, cardiac test. Oh, yes. Um, it replaces supplement digitalis that thereby um, uh, in decompensated patients. So digitalis, of course, is a drug that just keeps pushing the heart. And the cardiotrophin does the opposite. It relieves the burden instead of pushing it, it gives it a break. It increases muscle tone and thus increases the capacity for exertion. Well, let's look at that. Is that really true what they said? Now, you could never, you could never say that cardiotrophin now is a replacement for digitalis or the FDA would be all over you. So let's look at, I did with three different clients. I had them chew up four cardiotrophin in, uh, in an expanse of 10 minutes. Okay. So let's look at this. Now, this isn't client 72, but these are three others because I wanted to make sure that you didn't think, well, we're just doing this with this one client strengthening her heart and working with her uh, atrial AFib. Here's another one. So uh, what I want you to look at is the disturbance in the rest periods, which is a form of AFib. That's that upper part of the heart beating irregularly when it shouldn't. So you can see that, oh, pretty good S1, right? All this disturbance, there's the S2, more disturbance. There's the S1, look how spread out it is. The closure is very slow. Instead of a crisp closure, it's very slow. There's the S2 more disturbance, you can't look at all the disturbance in here. 10 minutes later, giving four cardiotrophins. So what did the nutrient do when I gave it to this person? It simply took the load off. Take the load off, Annie, right? That's the famous song. And you put the load right on me. Yes, put the load right on cardiotrophin. It will do its job. 10 minutes later, there is no disturbance. Now, remember that once you give a person cardiotrophin, it will reveal what I've called the next layer. It will reveal what other things they need. And this person needs some B because she's got a splitting in here. You can see it. Or maybe even a pre-systolic. I'm not quite sure. That could be the, but you'll clarify that later. And they definitely have leakage here here, here. Now, you can see the three peaks. It does weaken here, but continuing the cardiotrophin over time, that peak should come up. There's one case. 
Here's another case, very similar. Uh, the S1 is really one peak and a huge split, and then an extra beat in there. Again, disturbance, see it? Look how these all have one peak. So let's see after 10 minutes, oh, those peaks are coming back. The main one, one here, one here, and maybe what this looks like, um, I'm not sure if that's leakage or not. So that will clarify itself again over time and adding in the B core with that person. Can you see this difference? 10 minutes, everyone. I didn't give them six a day for three weeks. This was 10 minutes. That's how fast cardiotrophin removes the burden. And of course, this final one, look at this. Look at this uh, very concerning AFib. This heart never rests. And I'll tell you a story after this. So gave this person four, waited basically 10 minutes, almost completely gone after this extreme. What this person, because I had this person over for dinner, what they said to me, we ate dinner and I, I might have given them uh, three or four more because I was so concerned about this that um, they, and I said, well, how are you feeling? And they said to me, I feel so relaxed. I feel a deep sense of rest. And they were in my uh, recliner across from where I was sitting and they, they were almost fell asleep watching TV in my home. There it was. Do I need more proof than that? This is a heart that is never at rest. This is a heart that is almost at rest. But remember, once you do the take the cardiotrophin, it is going to reveal other underlying factors. Look at these pre -systolic. This is called a pre-systolic murmur. This is where you need the cataplex G. See it? And, and the B for the, these patterns here. He's got, he's got a buildup of fat and calcium along this. This is all the mitral valve, by the way. I didn't test any other valve, just the mitral because it does the most work, of course. So he needs the G and the B along with the cardiotrophin. So once we understand the heart itself and its ability to pump or not pump based on electrical, um, we, we have much more capability of helping these people. And as I say, the, the cells in the heart beat from within themselves. We may not immediately think of our hearts as a collection of individual cells, but it is the complex of interaction of numerous cell types that give the heart its ability to pump blood. Some cells from the heart uh, connective tissue, other cells grow into the heart valves. So you never think of the heart valve as having cells, but they do. And all of those have an inherent nature. That inherent nature is to beat. Now, the, the cartilage cells don't necessarily beat, but most of the rest of the blood cells do the connective tissue cells. And muscle cells give the heart its ability to beat, pump blood throughout the body. Now, this is interesting. This is from Dr. Lee. And what he does is he goes into about testing with the heart. And, um, but here's what I wanted to read to you. The nervous control of the heart is affected by means of a balance of power of the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So he's saying here that the autonomic nervous system can either override the heart or 
it can complement the heart. And this is what he's explaining here. The heart too fast, AFib, fibrillation of other, other kinds, um, palpitations, all of that is the, partly the lack of integrity of the cells within the heart, but also the influence of the central nervous system. Now, what regulates that? Pituitary, thyroid, and the other endocrine glands that relate to them. As a result of the opposing stimuli received from the sympathetic or vagus or parasympathetic, the sympathetic tends to speed up and increase circulation of the blood in response to physiological demands. The vagus inhibits according to similar demands. One is the accelerator, one is the brake. So it's good to read this through. But the most important piece of this is this. Exercise, anger, and emotions. So here we are, and you know me, I love to talk the esoteric piece of this, of the lifestyle piece of this. Over-exercising, anger, and emotions initiate sympathetic. And it so he's talking about this, about people handling their internal climate, but he's also talking about a mineral, a deficiency of potassium found in green leafy vegetables can paralyze the vagus, allowing the stimulant uh, sympathetic to have too great and too prolonged an effect, which he calls and we call sympathetic atonia. So, those are your two major factors with people that, like client 72, they speed up, they slow down, anything over exercising. She's not, she walks two miles a day, that's very balanced. Her emotions are good, but she needs the organically bound minerals. And that's why you'll see I have her on that. So these rhythmical patterns, basically your greatest tool is the cataplex B core. Now you can fix removing the burden, not fix, but you can help the body remove that burden with the cardiotrophin, but then under those, those second layers, right? We saw those, we've got to fix those arrhythmic patterns and we've got to not fix, excuse me. Uh, we got. We have to help the body heal that factor of not having the electrical conduction, not having the uh, normal electrical currents and pathways within the body. And here is where this product, as you all know, has become famous. This product cannot be found in synthetic B vitamins. And Lee says this here. Vitamin B is a matter of fact, probably the most single factor in the B complex is the B4 fraction, otherwise known as the anti-paralysis vitamin. Fast, slow, fast, slow. If you give a, a patient synthetic thymine, these are all your other B vitamins and in cereals and bread. When he is deficient in B4, he will tempor temporarily respond, respond, but very soon has a relapse and be worse than ever. And this is why your clients are coming into the office. Oh, I take a B vitamin. You run the graph. The graph is a mess because they have gotten worse from taking that B supplement. Heart disease is the commonest reaction, I believe, to B4 deficiency. So he said heart disease is pretty much a B4 deficiency. The innervation to the heart becomes partly paralyzed. The pulse becomes erratic. 
Extracystalies are common and unfortunately fibrillation may develop, AFib. And I'll let you read this one through because he goes into the B4. But the devastating effects of B4 deficiency, remember everyone, to this day, if you ask any reductionist, they say there's no such thing as B4 because they can't measure it and make it in a lab and it doesn't exist. Well, that's not true. It occurs in nature. Lee was rejected, doesn't exist. And we have been to date, but we all know that it does. We've seen it over and over again, reestablishing normal B. Uh, the B4 deficiencies are not so well known. One of the first notice is the most important effect of the A vitaminosis of deficiency in B is bradycardia, too slow. So prevalent among beriberi sufferers. Sufferers Harris, one of these endocrinologists claims that this cardiac effect is due to an excess of lactic acid. These are also the people, especially as they age, if they go out for a walk, their muscles are sore. That is a sign that you're B4 deficient. That's the one that oxidize, uh, is, uh, which is not oxidized, that gets rid of, that breaks down that lactic acid in the absence of B vitamin. Tre tremors, extrasystole, skip beats, fibrillation, bottom branch block, arrhythmias, and heart block. These phenomena are usually due to a loss of conductivity. I would say here, a loss of conductivity and a deficiency of the B4 factor. Otherwise, yeah, maintain balance. So I'll let you read this through. Um, and he talks about the distortion in the valves themselves, creating this regurgitation and these other arrhythmic factors. So, And remember that, that the B4 factor that we know exists, that's been rejected by the reductionists, only occurs in nature. It only occurs in these four foods. Defatted wheat germ is the primary, rice bran polishings. So if you, if you eat white rice, you are depleting yourself in the B4 factor because the body tries to make that white, that white rice from a nutritional standpoint, from a frequency standpoint whole so that the body can use it. So it will rob from your reserves of the Bs to try to use that, not just use it as a starch, as a carbohydrate, but to use it as a B vitamin. And liver, which nobody eats, loaded with B vitamins, B4 factor, and nutritional yeast. And they add in some beet and carrot juice too. Beets can have uh, some have B vitamins as well. So I'm not. I've, these are things that I've already said to you. And let's just take a minute now. We talked about lifestyle. What do de what depletes B vitamins? Coffee, sunlight, too much sun, tea, nicotine, sugar, alcohol, processed food. And they acknowledge this about the cardiomyopathies. What did they say? Alcohol and whatever else they said. Lifestyle. So, and to read through, this is important as your homework, to read these through as to what B vitamins do because they do a lot more than what we think, not just related to the heart, converting carbohydrates, normalizing nerve function, helping with hair, skin, eyes, liver. So, so just to finish this section, these are your two primary products that most of your clients should be on. How long? 
rest of their life, these two. Otherwise you get into these. And if they have these patterns as client 72, the rest of their life, they cannot do without these. You must remove the burden and reestablish electrical balance over time. And over time, it's seen most of uh, 72's heart is in pretty good, conser considering what she's been through in her life, pretty balanced. Now, remember that um, when we looked at that one with the presystolic, you would want to use cataplex G. So that's why I said that, that person needs B and G, okay? Again, very similar, as I say, the protocols in my book, what I'm, what I'm sharing with you today is honoring those factors. Here's the organically bound minerals that we'll look at. And of course the G. Now, how can you tell if a person needs G? You could say, well, everybody needs to be core, but when do I add in the G? Here it is, Lee outlines it perfectly the redness of palms and soles of the feet, uh, spasms, uh, numbness, any type of paralysis. They say, oh, I get tingling in my hands and my feet. Veins showing on their chest and abdomen and hemorrhoids. Eyes, how are your eyes? Well, you know, I always feel like I, my eyes are gritty. They like they have sand in the eyes. That's G. And they're just. They, it could be a loss of appetite. Um, they have a lot of apprehension. Well, I'm just not sure. I what what you know? I ask clients. Well, what are you happy in your life? Yes. Well, what what aren't you happy about? Well, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure what to do all the time. Now, there's other things that they need to do, but supplements carry the frequency of helping people. When they say, I'm just not interested in anything and I'm not, and I'm not sure what to do. Gee. And a lot of, of digestive symptoms will go away. So, you could just read these through and apply it where you think it should be to your clients. Now, remember that uh, we talked about with these going too fast, whether it's AFib or fibrillation, then that de potassium deficiency, our, and this is one of the reasons why in the United States, Western society, we eat way too much carbohydrate. So that, that glucose gets to the brain and it gets to the muscles. Then the muscle over fires. Well, what did he say in that other article? He said that potassium calms that vagus nerve down. By the way, this, is, this also relates to people that have high acid. They have chronic heartburn. That is the vagus nerve overstimulated producing too much stomach acid. So this doesn't just relate to the heart, relates to the whole body. Person with chronic diarrhea, overstimulation of the vagus nerve. Now they're sympathetic dominant. The tiger is always chasing them. That's G and, organic, and organically bound minerals, your potassium supplement. So again, you can read these through and um, and here again, this supports, suppose a deficiency of potassium develops with consequent overstimulation of the sympathetic by reason of the impaired vagus in inhibition, the heart will be found to be laboring as if the demands of exercise You can write in your notes, write in your favorite, uh, your favorite, why is that doing that?
Okay, sorry. I don't know what that's doing. Um, um, you can write in your notes in whatever book reminds you. If the heart is laboring, if a person says to you, uh, I can't get control of my heart at night, my heart is pounding, make sure that they take the potassium. That is the governor that provides the regulation of glucose in the muscle. Oops, so sorry about that. Let me just uh, go back here. I was trying to get rid of that thing and it disappeared on its own. And what did Dr. Lee say about that? Dr. Lee was very clear that always ask people about their hearts. He said, you shouldn't even know that you have a heart. So very important to that regulation of the heart itself. And, and people that say to you, um, well, you know, I, I get palpitation. If I have chocolate, if I have coffee, if I, if I uh, somebody, I have a traffic incident, if I get upset, I get this palpitation in my heart. That is organically bound minerals. So remember that now, along with the G and other things. The other is, of course, um, which I have client 72 on. So remember, I have her on cardiotrophin B, organically bound minerals. Here's her other one, cataplex E2. Why? Well, here it is. The nervousness of the heart, cardiac neurosis. Uh, any type of neurological loss of neurological in, integrity anywhere in the body. Um, and because this helps, and again, look at the products that go with it in the physiological, ideological background. G and organically bound minerals, there is the pattern. And uh, you can read this through, but remember, the main thing with someone that goes too fast is they lose the ability to maintain normal oxygen levels in their muscles and in their heart. And this is what E2 is claimed to fame. This is the high altitude vitamin. This is the supplement, this extract from the E complex. And this was another client of mine that I worked with um, and his heart rate and what did I use? the G, the E2, organically bound minerals. Now, even though client 72, she goes fast and normal, fast and normal. I wanted to give her, especially the organically bound minerals and the E2 for being so fast. Yes, I could add in G, but I, I you know, again, I'm limited. And the B core has quite a bit. So in two weeks with this individual, on nine of each of these a day for two weeks, he completely normalized. The other with any type of AFib or abnormal rhythms, thyroid hormone has direct effects on the heart. Here's the article, you can read this through. Hyperthyroidism increases the heart rate and can cause palpitations as well as abnormal heart rhythms. Now you could say, well, she, well, she wasn't diagnosed with Graves. What are you talking about, Joe? The heart can go fast and then it could go slow, fast and slow. Doesn't have to be all the time. That's the worst case scenario. But once such abnormal heart rhythm is, is atrial, uh, once, yeah, atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular beating of the heart and can lead to heart failure and stroke. Both overt and subclinical hyperthyroid increase the risk of developing uh, AFib. Uh, interesting, some studies suggest that subclinical, this is what I say, hypothyroidism may also increase the risk of developing atrial fibrillation. That's why we can, 
to have a conversation and argue the point, well, this is just in fast heart. No, there's because uh, a fast yeah, heart, they're saying it can be either or, or that fluctuation in thyroid, um, thyroid health as a person gets older, especially women. Client 72 is a woman. Here it is. Hypothyroidism may also increase the risk of developing AFib. Thyroid hormone has a direct effects on the heart. Hyperthyroidism increases rate and causes palpitation as well as abnormal heart rhythms. Both the sub, both overt and subclinical hyperthyroidism increases the risk, uh, risk of developing AFib. And so I am not so, uh, I am not so concerned whether she's got of a diagnosis of hyper or hypo. I'm interested as a clinician of once again, removing the burden on her thyroid to function normally all the time. And so, and I give, I give a whole lecture on the alliance of thyroid governs heart, heart governs kidney, which you can listen to on my YouTube channel. So you can go through these, these sim symptoms uh, for using uh, thytrophin, but you can also realize why I put her on thytrophin. Now, she was diagnosed along with AFib with a mitral valve prolapse. So that's why if you look at the protocol, I have her on magnesium. The mitral valve is between the left, all of that, normal flaps. Okay, normally the flaps are held tightly closed during the left ventricular contraction called systole. Now, remember, if the heart changes shape or gets enlarged or thickens, that muscle pulls away from the valve, creating this leakage. It's supposed to be tightly together. But, not but, but and, so you could say, okay, well, we're going to give the, the, uh, we're going to give the, cardiotrophin and the B to bring the tone in and the electrical current that creates that tone. But there's another factor, which I haven't done with her yet with client 72. Because I've been trying to, after all this smoke inhalation from the fires in California, trying to get her out of this crisis that she's been in. But here's the other, which I'll mention at the end. The normal, normally the flaps are held together tightly during ventricular contraction by tendons, cordi tendons, small tendon cords that connect the flaps to the muscles. So here is another whole factor with her that down the road here, as she has improved and they decided not to do the, the, uh, the mitral valve surgery, to give nutrition a chance. So, and here it is. Studies have been done on this, we know this. Correction of symptomatology by the oral physiological uh, is the best proof that it is due to magnesium deficiency. Magnesium deficiency is essential and specific for idiopathic mitral valve prolapse. That's why I have her on the magnesium. You can try to use Easy Mag that has a good wider range of all different types of magnesium, but this one seems to be working for her. This is the one I've used. Here are the cordi tendons. You see this? This is normal. 
this is how hers is. You see how the flaps are not closing? And that's the loss of integrity of those tendons. So here is my plan for her in the future, not just to stabilize her. Now, these other products now are part of the stabilization. So she's on a blood thinner, which is going to over time uh, diminish the integrity of her vasculature, especially her big, her big blood, blood vessels, her larger blood vessels, not, and her capillaries but the larger blood vessels as well. So that's why I have her on this, to strengthen the integrity uh, of that, of the, the using the rutin or the P factor to establish the integrity of the collagen in the blood vessel. So you can read this through. And you we've talked about this before that, in, uh, in uh, 2012, I think, at Harvard, they, pr they proved uh, researchers discovered Rutin's antithrombic property when they screened 5,000 compounds and found uh, the block the action, a key protein involved in the formation of blood vessel clotting. That's why they're calling this factor the rutin from buckwheat leaf, the anti-stroke vitamin involved in the formation of vessel clogging. Uh, when rutin rose to the top of the list, it was very surprising. Well, it wasn't to Dr. Lee 70 years ago. And we still don't understand exactly why it is so potent. Well, that's okay. We understand why. So that's why she's on that to prevent stroke. Now, she's also taking calcia food and syrup food, which, because I wanted to make, and being a 17, 72 year old woman, prevent osteopenia, osteoporosis, but to give her more protein. Remember, she said she stopped eating a lot of red meat and more vegetables so she's not getting her protein so she's on the two powders calcium food and syrup food which is syrup food is half catalan and half um calcium food so and other things too what is calcium food made of well here dr lee says it's made from the veal ribs meat which has the tendons in there marrow and all. Now, whether they still make it that way or not, I believe that they do. And it gives you, and he goes into in this article, it's a very well-written article of all the amino acids and what they're used for and all contained in calcium food. So don't think of calcium food just for your bones and your teeth. Think of it for a protein source of all 26 amino acids. And also, of course, I have her on RNA because RNA helps with thyroid function in which Dr. Goodhart taught us. It helps distribute T3 from the bloodstream and get it into the cellular network, into the tissues. So T3 is not, doesn't carry the same focus as T4. T4 is more for metabolic rate. T3 is for the integrity of the tissues itself. It establishes uh, the the mechanism, here it is, Dr. Lee says that the mechanism of protein synthesis for tissue used is believed to be dependent upon RNA metabolism and integrity of the protein complex, where this factor is uh, deficient, may amount uh, to for the observed clinical results. That's why if you have a client on synthetic T4, there's no T3, 
course, their rationale is, well, the body will make, the liver will make it uh, and uh, break it into T3. What happens if the liver is not healthy? That's why they have a thyroid problem in the beginning because the liver is not healthy. It's a big factor. And so this is why they need this RNA factor in relationship to the thyroid, which relates to the heart. So, and by the way, everyone, a lot of people are asking me, well, what, you know, after the COVID and if even if they've had uh, vaccines, what is the one product? This is the product. This is the product to use and I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. So, because um, the regulation of the chromosome itself, the controlling mechanism is the RNA. And uh, it's well said here that ribonucleic acid, so DNA is exclusively found in the nucleus of the cell, probably in the chrom chromatin. Ribo RNA is found both, both in the nuclear wall where it is capable of being synthesized and in certain cytoplasmic granules. It is the RNA fraction of the nuclear protein, which is a growth promoter when added to tissue in vitro. So that's how they determine this. An increase in the cytoplasmic content of RNA is associated with protein synthesis and cell division. We want cells to normally function and divide. We don't want them to abnormally. And it is the RNA factor that provides the normalization of cell division. Fisher, Dr. Fisher demonstrated that the nonspecific growth promoting properties of beef embryo nuclear proteins are primarily due to the RNA fraction rather than the DNA fraction. It is now widely delivered that one fraction of the RNA acid in the cell is the messenger, R the messenger RNA. Now, everyone's concerned about these vaccines, and I respect how anybody feels about it, but there's been a lot of wild, crazy, stupid ideas, which I won't get into. Don't get me going with this. And if you want to, if you're concerned about these vaccines bringing synthetic messenger RNA into these people's bodies, then use the normal RNA messenger, ribonucleic acid in the tablet form, is responsible for the transmission of genetic information from the DNA. This is its role, everyone. If you want cells to reestablish their balance in any condition, any breakdown, any aging, you must have RNA. If it's affecting cells of the body with chemicals from vaccines or other drugs, you must use RNA. Here it is. RNA, messenger RNA, natural messenger RNA is responsible for the transmission of genetic information from the DNA and of the nucleus of the cytoplasm. This messenger RNA has been identified uh, with of total RNA. So here's a couple of instances. Uh, University of Sweden reported qualitative changes of RNA in the uh, neuroganglia and the neuro uh, in the neuron in Parkinson's disease. Here's one case. Substantial improvements were recorded in clinical study of age patients consistently with uh, 
pre-senile, senile, and arterial sclerotic individuals with severe memory loss. Here's another. So RNA, which I believe everyone should take 1,000 milligrams a day, that's six of the RNA tablets made by standard process, is so important, uh, I, I can't express it enough. And so it is, and with protein synthesis. So client 72, to return to her, I want to keep her thyroid normal. I want to keep the the replication of normal cells in her heart for as long and who knows how far it can come back. That's why I added this product in. The other relates to the nerve pathways and the damage. And that's this product, Super EFF. Any degenerative condition where the cells are rapidly de deteriorating, this form of vitamin S F is readily uh, utilized because it is already metabolized. Uh, here it is about the chromosome again. Lee called Super EFF a chromosome protector. So with RNA and with Super EFF, you can pretty much rest assured that at the cellular level, in relationship to the heart, in relationship to your brain, that that protection at least has some nutri nutrients that help with that protection. So, um, and here he says it related to the heart. With protomorphogens, we can help build up whatever tissue is degenerating. With super EFF, we can protect the tissue. If it is muscle tissue, that is deteriorating, use muscle protomorphogen, i.e. cardiotrophin. If the nerve tissue is degenerating, then use nerve protomorphogen, i.e. neurotrophin. So this is a great article of this product. And in the case of client 72, she'll need to have this phospholipid wrapper, this protective wrapper around all of her nerve cells. And that will, over time, decrease the, the, the uh, protection of those nerve cells so they're not going fast and slow and fast and slow. Here it is from his book, Dr. Lee. The first is tachycardia. Here it is. All kinds of conditions. Apparently synergistic with inositol, which is a potentiating effect of energy metabolism, ATP, how energy acts within the muscle as evidenced by beneficial effect in tachycardia. He said super EFF normalizes 60%, helps to normalize 60% the people with tachycardia. So I'm not going to go into these, the telomeres, but those two products, well, maybe I will, must protect chromosome ends. So the telomeres being recognized process as a double strand breaks. Identification and the factors involved in the end protection. So this is like a shoelace that un, begins to unravel. That's what happens with the chromosome. That's why cells do not they age, they die too quickly, and they do not maintain their integrity because they have lost that the telomeres on either end of the cell, normal telomere end. That's why the cells deplete and cannot, in many cases, be the integrity of those cannot be brought back. And here is RNA and super EFF once again. So my additional thoughts with her real briefly, as well as um, what I already have her on over time, again, is to use this cardiac blend. So afibrillation, tachycardia, arrhythmias, Hawthorne, motherwort, uh, uh, don't quite. And you can read about these so what does Hawthorne 
most of use for chest pain, heart failure, blood circulation problems, high blood pressure, anxiety. There's Tawthorn. What about motherwort? Arrhythmia is not related to underlying heart or uh, systemic pathology, but our uh, strong cause uh, a palpitation or anxiety can quiet, uh, can be quiet, quite deliberating. Um, uh, motherwort as a remedy for functional heart complaints due to autonomic imbalance. Electrical, pract eclectic uh, practitioners uh, use this herb. So here is motherwort providing, reducing, uh, calming the patient, reducing anxiety, fear of heart disease, and stress. So here is motherwort's part in the speeding up part of her heart. Uh, Dong Kwai is also known as the angelic sinuness, sinuness um, an herbal remedy that may decrease your heart rate. So again, addressing that speeding up of, of in this case, uh, uh, helps decrease hypertension, elevated blood pressure over time. So that blend from my book, remember, this is from my book. And I have a series of blends in the back of my book may also be something that I'll look down the road with her. And then, of course, just to finish is the thymus. And broken or damaged heart, shock related trauma. Who knows what happens to people in their younger life? We don't remember it. But here is where the thymus, which I read in the very beginning. And here is what Dr. Lee wrote about it. And remember that any organ that is hyperactive, not just the adrenals, not just the thyroid, thymus can be used, by the way. Graves disease, uh, myasthenia gravis, any organ, gland, or tissue that is hyper, that is enlarged, you can use thymus. Yes. And I have a whole lecture on the thymus that I go into this deep, deeply. It is known that changes occur in thymus tissue during periods of stress, atrophy being observable. Autopsies of healthy body soldiers during World War II revealed a much larger thymus gland than was considered normal. So, and these uh, break down in great numbers during illness and provide of, of immune reaction. So, and allergic reaction. So this is something that I would also consider with her to this day, I take three thymus PMG a day, always, just to handle living this life on earth. And then the, uh, the final, uh, just to share with you, which I always already went over, if, if I were to work with these tendons with the mineral manganese is the specific one to bring the tone back into the tendons to help this arrhythmic pattern and this enlargement and the closure of her mitral valve in the case of uh, client 72 is ligaplex one as a high amount of manganese and <clears throat> the glandular or endocrine gland related to that mineral is pituitropin. Now a client like this, just to finish, I like to have them, she has on her wrist, um, a watch that she can tell if her heart rate is up, but you can also get these pulse oximeters and of course a blood pressure cuff, which a blood pressure cuff that I feel all clients should have in their home. Not that they get neurotic about testing it, but they um, in fact can use these to monitor, especially if you're giving them supplements 
And if they do work with their cardiologist to wean themselves or lower the dosages on their drugs, their medications. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, there was a lot here. You can review these notes and then of course, go back to my uh, lecture uh, from the beginning and listen to it a few more times. But in the end, everyone, we understand that as the original endocrinologist said, that our service to humanity is to work with the normal function of the body through whatever we use uh, of normalizing the endocrine system or, or uh, normalizing organ function and normalizing their lifestyle. So thank you all for being on and I will look forward to being with you in one month. My heart sound recording lecture uh, next week will is canceled because I'll be with Charlie Dubois, the president of Standard Process, gonna spend part of the day with him. So thank you all for being on and my blessings to you as we continue this journey, this wonderful, exciting journey together. Thank you, Joseph. You're welcome. Joseph, you, do you mean Joseph. Tuesday? Tuesday the 23rd is canceled? Yeah, I had to cancel it because okay. that's when he could see me, yes. No yes. problem, thank you so much. Super, we wanna know all about the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, take care. Thank everybody. you, Joseph. You're thank welcome. you. Thank you.